Hey, Dave. Hey, how are you, David? Good. So I'm here with Dave Vago, who's uh, an instructor at Harvard Medical School, and he's the former senior scientist at Mind and Life. Uh, you can check out his work at contemplativeneurosciences.com. Uh, so Dave, you've been involved in the mindfulness meditation research field pretty much since its beginning, I think, or its, its widespread uh, time of application and research. So what's changed in your mind from when you just started hmm. getting into this field to uh, its current level of popularity? Do you see mindfulness meditation differently than you did back then? Huh, that's, good. that's an interesting question. Uh, I, I, I don't really feel like a pioneer of sorts uh, because I came into it... Um, well, I came into it from my own, with my own personal practice in the 90s uh, when I was in college, uh, but I'd only fused it with my own science, um, with cognitive neuroscience in 2004, 2005, when I went to a Mind and Life uh, um, uh, Summer Research Institute and saw that not only were there real um, scientists exploring the mind through the lens of uh, meditation and contemplative practices. But there was a real niche that was that needed more rigorous science to investigate the mind in that way. Um, so I took that opportunity and, uh, and certainly a lot has changed since 2005. Um, but we can't, we, we can't forget the, the 2600, uh, years that have passed since then as well that have uh, investigated the mind in a similar way. So and you're talking about Buddhism. Buddhism, right. right. The, the Dharma, the, sort of the Buddhist science perspective of mind. So, it, um, so it's originally a Buddhist practice. I think that a lot of people now who practice it probably consider themselves spiritual but not religious, uh, or, or, and it's often... Uh, Right. Presented as a secular practice, uh, so yes. This what role do what role do beliefs play in this practice? Can it, can anyone study mindfulness meditation? Right. Yeah. So we do have to draw this sort of contrast between the contemporary usage of the term mindfulness and its roots in the Buddhist contemplative uh, uh, um, system of mental training, um, namely the Dharma. You know, one is sort of has a goal of stress reduction where, you know, some people just want to relieve a little stress, uh, reduce some symptoms of depression, and anxiety. And the other is to achieve enlightenment. And, you know, there, there are some commonalities between the two uh, sort of systems or models for practice. Uh, like, you know, the practices are the same. Um, so what we did is, you know, in terms of the science was to break down the actual practices and say, well, here's the commonality between if you're a long-term practitioner or if you just started meditation for the first time, you are doing this the same. You're sitting, you have a certain set of instructions on how to pay attention. Uh, you have a particular intention that might be slightly different, but your attention will be similar in the sense of how it's directed towards an object like your breath or towards anything that arises, for example. Those are the two most common meditations. And so what we did is we just unpacked it, and we looked at the cognitive and the neurobiological substrates that are underlying those practices. And, you know, from that, we can understand what changes, how the self, for example, transforms through these practices. So it doesn't right. matter who you are. As long as you're doing these practices, so, something may change. So basically, it doesn't matter what your belief system is, from the neurobiological standpoint, there are certain changes that will predictably occur. And just at the end there, you, you mentioned some changes to the sense of self. Right. And I know one article, we'll post the link at the bottom, uh, an article that you wrote recently uh, tried to position mindfulness within a framework that you call the S-ART framework, so self Awareness, self-regulation, and self-transcendence. Can you talk a little so, bit about yeah. what you're saying in that paper? Sure. Um, you know, I, I should also just 
make the caveat that yes, of course, we think no ma- doesn't matter what your beliefs are, there will be some neurobiological changes, some plasticity just by doing these practices. But as we all know, belief is critical to uh, a lot of change as well. Um, and that, as we know, things like the placebo effects have such a dramatic impact on uh, on our physical body and mind and brain. So we have to keep that in mind, and we can come, we can revisit the whole belief uh, um, aspect of. Well, I, I'm interested in what you said there. Sort of, so are you kind of drawing a connection between religious belief and the placebo effect? Uh, I think there is some connection. I wouldn't say it's completely covered by placebo, but there, uh, I think I, I was using it really as an example sure. of how, how belief in itself can, ma- can actually change um, the physical nature of our brain or, and body. So there may be a connection certainly between religious belief systems and placebo, but I don't think that's the whole story. Sure. And so just to tag on to that, uh, you know, a lot of these conversations are about spirituality, which we're trying to come to some kind of consensus definition of. So we've been talking about religion. Um, What is your definition or your understanding of spirituality and how it fits into this discussion? Yeah. So uh, most scientists, I would say, probably stay away from from. Uh, talking about spirituality um, or spiritual experience. Um, I think a lot of scientists these days may be a little bit more comfortable with it, with, and we've had this conversation before, right. with the idea of meaning. Um, it's only because I see that contrast a lot in, in the sciences, uh, even in the contemplative sciences. I, I, I think you know, the model that we created, the SART model, uh, was uh, really a way to unpack how we understand systems of self-processing and uh, all aspects of selfing. So we can look at aspects of, of present moment awareness to early perceptual processing to cognitive forms of evaluation of the world uh, to the mental habits that underlie, that are sort of underneath the hood of what's driving self or what's conditioning self over time. So, so I, that's a really interesting verbing of of self. So, oh, selfing, absolutely. selfing. Okay. Yes. So, so SART as the S art framework, yep. you think uh, pretty much exhaustively covers the. the I what think it, the it self attempts can do? to do that. Okay. Yeah, so interesting. I talk about four systems of selfing. Uh, really, one that's associated with perceptual uh, states that are sort of non conscious things that are prepared, preparing the body to, to do, to move, to self. Uh, and then a, a first person experience, which is I am or I am, uh, I am aware, and you are in the present moment, first person experience. Uh, and then there is more cognitive or evaluative uh, kind of selfing, which is more narrative focused. And lastly, you have a transcendent state of self, which uh, I think really speaks to the question of spirituality that you, that you mentioned. And this idea of spiritual experience uh, has to manifest from, number one, a state of meta-awareness, where there is a, a overarching uh, a sort of um, uh, uh, monitor of what is happening uh, in time and space related to all other states of selfing. So you can flexibly move between states of selfing with that awareness. And once that skill is developed, then you start to develop uh, less, there's less focus on self, self-focused self needs, uh, wants and desires, and there's a transcendence of self towards others where the, there's a, a breaking down of the barriers. And as we've discussed in, in our paper that we've written together, a sense of unity. Um, and that sense of unity is really uh, how the brain really likes to experience the world. It doesn't, have, it doesn't necessarily make the distinction between self and other. And that's more of a societal sort of construct, self, other, the differences. And that would be a sort of a Buddhist characterization Absolutely, it fits very squarely with the Buddhist characterization. And, and so, you really support 
uh, kind of bringing that the Buddhist worldview into some of the assumptions that psychology makes. I, I've noticed that in some of your other your other work as well. Yeah, and now I'm I'm actually so. Um, and we had kind of a disagreement about that. I remember and when we were writing our paper. Uh, you know, I I have this reflexive instinct to take out any kind of uh, cultural baggage and sh- try to strip things down to their most. Uh, whether this is possible or not, I don't really know. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> to their most basic, most abstract descriptors, um, but you know, I think you're right in that there might be some omissions there of cultural traditions that are useful when thinking about these ideas. Right, exactly. Well, you know, this is, this is where um, uh, we can really start to unpack some of the, the, system, the Buddhist system of, of mental training, where um, enlightenment uh, certainly has a lot of baggage and has been contextualized in many different forms across uh, schools of Buddhism. Um, but we can take that, that, that term, that concept, and contextualize it in a more contemporary way. And so, so sort of what we're doing is just translating. Because if we're going to take a term like mindfulness and try to apply it in contemporary settings, well, then I think it's, we have every right to be able to take any concept from that Buddhist model and try to unpack it and translate it into more modern, contemporary, cognitive and psychological terms so we can understand it from the perspective of the, you know, the Western mind. Right. Uh, and there's, a, there's such a rich uh, you know, literature about mind in, from Buddhism that we can learn from and that we can attempt to translate uh, into uh, terms that are uh, applied that, that we can understand better. Do you think that's equally true of other traditions beyond Buddhism? Yeah, absolutely. I just think the, the, the Buddhist taxonomy is very rich when it comes to understanding the mind. So sure. that's one, one system of thinking, one epistemology of mind that we can uh, really learn from and draw from. So en- enlightenment just happens to be a very abstract concept. But if we can find s- states of selfing that are uh, transcendent of self-focused types of processing and more towards uh, uh, an experience of unity, um, uh, moments of very sharp clair- perceptual clarity uh, and loss of time and space that are consistent um, across practitioners who, who do these practices, then we can recontextualize it and say, well, here are these um, sort of substrates, these patterns that we can observe both from a cognitive psychological and neurobiological point of view. And we can start to understand when people have, when they say they have a spiritual experience, uh, we can start to understand that, that pattern in, in a more realistic way. So that's really interesting. So you're, you're talking about taking uh, or this, these terms that have a very rich cultural tradition and explaining them using your knowledge base, which is cognitive neuroscience, uh, you also have a project that I'm really excited to learn more about, which is sort of going in the other direction, where the rich cultural tradition of Buddhism, specifically Tibetan Buddhism, uh, you're going there uh, to India uh-huh. to, to teach neuroscience, cognitive neuroscience, to uh, Tibetan Buddhist monks on the invitation of the Dalai Lama. So that's fascinating. Can you, can you tell me how that came to be and what you're planning to teach? Sure, sure. So uh, the Dalai Lama has uh, recognized the value of having dialogue with more Western scientists uh, who hold that Western perspective of mind because um, he's a scientist himself. He's very interested in how things function. Uh, he doesn't take anything at face value. Yeah, I should say that that I actually had a private audience with the Dalai Lama where I was expecting to learn more about Buddhist meditation practice from him, but he basically spent most of the time grilling me about the most 
recent research in neuroscience. <laughs> uh, so it was a really interesting experience to, uh, and I would agree with your assessment. I mean, he very much thinks like a scientist. Exactly. And that's what's so um, amazing about uh, His Holiness is that I really believe it's his intention that has sort of blossomed this field of, of science uh, in mindfulness. Mm -hmm. um, because really in 2004, that's when you start to see this sort of uh, dramatic rise in, in um, the literature. Um, and that's when the Mind and Life Institute really started to pick up speed and provide seed money to young investigators to investigate this kind of work. And that's really the only reason why I'm here today is that I got some grant funding. Wow. I was intrigued. Uh, and then there are, you know, about 150 people just like me who got funding as well, who are now across the world at various institutions doing this work. And so His Holiness has always had this in the back of his mind, I believe, to, to facilitate this sort of interdisciplinary dialogue between neuroscientists, cognitive neuroscientists, uh, who understand the mind from this Western point of view, and Buddhist scientists who are practitioners and monastics in training, trying to learn the mind from the Buddhist uh, historical context. So uh, he's now made it uh, sort of a, um, essential uh, part of the curriculum to, for monastics, for, from the Vajrayana uh, tradition at least to also learn cognitive neuroscience in addition to their traditional monastic training. So, so Buddhist monks now in the Tibetan tradition have, so, so there's this, what, 2,000 year long tradition that's probably remained relatively unchanged and within the past year or so, now neuroscience has been added to the curriculum. And that's amazing. And you're and it you're is. teaching it. So, so yeah. what are you and teaching? I mean, how? So yeah, how? I, you know, I, it was amazing when I saw him at the Society for Neuroscience meeting in 2005, and he gave he gave a talk there, and he said something along the lines of, "If neuroscience can figure out a way to enhance uh, or facilitate uh, the self transformative processes that are associated with meditative practice." through some stimulation or yeah some... he said placing an electrode in the brain he did which is unbelievable you know and i do some brain stimulation work here so you remember on... this oh i've i've cited it in multiple papers i was i was looking for something that he had said positive about neuroscience and i was completely blown away that he went as far as to say that uh, I should pull up the exact quote, yeah, but, but, it's, but what you just said is pretty close to it. I mean, right. that's that's astounding. So if there and was a way, sign for, up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I should so post this paper. I think I, again, I basically made the argument that he should. His interest is in neuroscience, and so yeah. Uh, so there's essentially there was essentially a um, uh, um, a there there are these dialogues that the Mind and Life Institute has been having formally. Uh, every other year in Dharamsala with His Holiness um, since 19, the late 1980s. And they've been really short uh, or very small intimate gatherings with a select group of scientists. And they're usually the scientists will describe some of their work and, uh, and explain it to His Holiness and His Holiness will respond a bit. But there's not always a lot of in-depth discussion and the monastics usually never have a chance to get involved. It's just His Holiness, and there's a lot of translation going on. Mm. So uh, finally, the Mind and Life Institute has decided to come up with a program that can be uh, in conjunction with one of those dialogues, uh, but focused on working specifically with the monastics, having more informal types of presentations and dialogue, and then reporting back to His Holiness the Dalai Lama. And that would be the beginning uh, of this sort of event uh, or this type of initiative to continue teaching the, the monks. And there's also a program called Science for Monks, uh, which uh, is a similar program trying to bring neuroscience to the monastic setting. So at least in this case, and we're going to the Sarah Monastery. Well? 
And the Sarah Monastery is one of the, the largest uh, Mahayana Buddhist monasteries um, in all of India, uh, and maybe even the world. Um, there's like 5,000 monastics there uh, at, a, at cer- certain times. And the idea for me and um, uh, Christy Wilson Mendenhall, a, a scientist from, uh, from Northeastern, will be our job is to talk specifically about the self and how we conceptualize self in neurobiological terms and in cognitive terms. And so I will be focusing. So I, I like to, to sort of talk about the self um, uh, as, as we understand mental habits. So as a string of moments in time, and if we conceptualize each moment as about 500 milliseconds of selfing, we can break down that 500 milliseconds into those four uh, 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 systems that I referred to before. The perceptual, the um, present moment, first person experiential, the uh, evaluative or narrative, and then the integrative or meta state of so, selfing so 500 milliseconds is the definition for the present moment well that's my sort of d- description of a moment of selfing okay. and it involves all four of those uh processes in time so was there a the, reason for that number or yeah so yeah. i mean I, I base it on physiological uh um, um data um so there's a lot of data that looks at how we respond to objects um, sensory objects. So whether it's visual sensory, visual sensory or somatosensory or auditory sensory, it doesn't matter. The point is when we respond, what we see is brainstem activity happens early on in response to uh, a stimulus um, around between zero or about 10 to 150 milliseconds. And then you start to see primary sensory cortex and association cortex happen between 100 uh, and uh, 250 milliseconds. So everything that happens up to that point is non-conscious, but it's your brain responding to a sensory object. And it's essentially filtering out whether it's salient enough, whether the stimulus is intense enough for you to actually have uh, conscious awareness of it. Okay. Uh, and then once there's conscious awareness, that's somewhere between 300 uh, and 500 milliseconds where you actually start to be aware of what you see and it gives you time to evaluate what you're seeing and do something with that information. So it's a, it's a sort of 500 milliseconds is a tidy neurobiological chunk of time where you can trace activation from the brain stem to the, uh, through to the, the sensory cortex. cortices to the frontal cortices. Okay. Yes, that's right. So, of course, you have quicker reactions usually, which happen before you even have conscious awareness. Like if you uh, have something thrown at you or you're about to get hit by a car, you run, get out of the way. Right. You know, those types of reactions are quick, but you don't have awareness of what you just did uh, for another few hundred milliseconds. Sure. So it almost goes back retrospectively in time to, uh, with, to match your, you know, your behavior. But... That general idea is that you have chunks of selfing that are happening every 500 milliseconds in time from birth to the present moment. And each moment is an opportunity to uh, become aware of those mental patterns and either move in a more adaptive trajectory for flourishing or to actually facilitate suffering. And we suffer a lot as human beings. We, uh, most importantly, if you really think about it, uh, the majority of our life is spent mind wandering. Uh, if you, there was a great study that everyone likes to cite with Matt Killingsworth, uh, where they looked at people's likelihood of mind wandering throughout the day. Uh, it was like uh, between ages of 18 and 88 years old, there's about 5,000 different samples of, 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 of data. But it, all the data came down to essentially saying that most people on average are mind wandering 47% of their day is spent mind wandering towards something that other than what they should be doing. So that's, that's interesting. Uh, you know, I, Scott Barry Kaufman's a creativity researcher and he's just a couple doors down in the lab here. And he often characterizes mind wandering as part of the default mode network and an essential process, uh, 
for creativity to occur. And so what you're talking about seems like it's a little bit in tension with that idea. And, and so is there a tension between creativity and mindfulness in your view? This is a great question because a lot of people these days think that mind wandering is just bad. And mm-hmm. we shouldn't do it because actually that study also showed that, that mind wandering was causally connected to unhappiness. And that your unhappiness was was causally dependent upon you mind wandering. So anytime you're mind wandering, you're more likely to be thinking something negative. Okay. Or like either reflecting negatively upon the past related to yourself or worrying about the future. And so this is part of the negativity bias. uh, That's right. Which we talk about a lot here. The negativity bias being just that, just what you just said, that that we we tend towards the negative. Tend towards the negative. In memory and in uh, prospection and in our self-evaluations in the the present as well. Right. So, but there is really good data, as you're suggesting also, suggesting that mind wandering is good for a creative incubation and for goal setting. Uh, and for drawing from even from the from the Buddhist perspective, there is a lot of of theory that talks about how self reflection, the evaluation of self processing, is good for 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 um, developing wisdom. That's interesting. Uh, so, in, more insight based insight, absolutely. Is, and there are meditations for this. But it's diff- they are different than mindfulness meditation. That's right. Okay. The key, though, is that you, the mind wandering has to be done when there's low cognitive load. If there's high cognitive load and you have high demand to do something with your attention, mind wandering in that context is bad. Uh, and it usually has a negative orientation in that context. That's really if interesting. If you have low cognitive load when you're just sitting around you know, on, the, on your commute, and you got you don't need to be using your attention with uh, or a lot of resources to do what you're doing. By all means, think creatively. <laughs> Mind wander. It doesn't have to be negative. It can be positive. That's a really interesting views on mind wandering, which I'm sure the monastics that you're that you'll be teaching will have very interesting views on this, very different from the scientists and students at Harvard exactly. Medical that you're used to interacting with. By the way, I found that, that Dalai Lama quote. I, I have it as the epigraph of, of a paper that I wrote, actually. Oh, cool. uh, so this was at the Society for Neuroscience. He said, if it was possible to become free of negative emotions by a riskless implementation of an electrode without impairing intelligence and the critical mind, I would be the first patient. And so, wow. basically, in the paper, I say that the Dalai Lama is probably going to need to show up at a cognitive neuroscience lab in the near future um, because there probably will be ways to uh, be free, at least very temporarily, of negative emotions. Uh, so I, I thought that was a fascinating. That that's awesome quote. that you found that. That's great because that's I mean that's directly related to why I'll be there, um, and and honestly, so. I talk about not only the systems of selfing, but I then talk about well, what are the causal factors of why there are some selves that manifest as suffering and others that manifest as flourishing? And can we identify those causal factors? And how are they related to mental training? Can mental training move somebody from suffering to a flourishing state? And certainly self-transcendence is part of that model of how people may actually move. They might develop in this sort of uh, spiritually, uh, in a spiritually de- spiritual development process. And there's actually great work on this. There's a book that I got recently. I don't know if you've ever seen this book. It's an oldie, uh, but um, this, I got this at the Divinity School. It's called Stages of Faith by James Fowler. Yeah, I, I, I'm familiar with it. I mean, I really think that the neurosciences, the new trend, and I'll, I'll say this uh, with you, I, I do believe, and I've talked with Ken Wilber about this as well, that we have to start to understand that there are stages of spiritual development um, or really just ego development that we have to take into consideration 
to understand how far somebody can really move in in terms of their self transformation. So Fowler, and, so just to explain a little backstory, so the the book that you held up, uh, James Fowler's, uh, was it Stages of uh, Stages of Faith? Is that the yep Stages of Faith? It's based on Kohlberg's moral yep. development theory, and right. it, and it's it's really just kind of mapping it on to. Uh, a religious or, or spiritual framework is sort of my understanding. Yep. Uh, and Ken Wilber, who you mentioned is a, is a, he kind of tries to synthesize various findings from, uh, moral, uh, psychology and, and some other developmental models and tries to provide a kind of model of spiritual development. I have a lot of problems with, with Ken Wilber's model, uh, actually, uh, you know, this whole, so it's really interesting that you say that you think that the direction that this is going to take is in moral development. Yep. Um, I, d I don't think I agree. I, 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 I didn't for a long time and I, uh, yeah, it only recently clicked for me. And, and let okay. me just explain yeah, why. I'm interested. There is this, so in the secular mindfulness movement, there is a uh, understanding that MBSR, for example, can lead to ethical and moral development implicitly that just by doing the practices that implicitly you will become more pro-social and and in, there's research to show that that is the case that to is some the extent. case to yeah. some extent although some of it is not so convincing i will say okay from what i've seen uh but in the buddhist traditions uh ethical and moral development is something that's very explicit there are certain uh uh paramitas uh you know, for, uh, for developing, flourishing, the perfections and generosity, discipline, patience, diligence, concentration, and wisdom. Those are explicit. Uh, it's an explicit path of, of but that's, that's That's true of every religion and, and really any kind of, of moral philosophical framework. Right. You know, so, so Jonathan Haidt uh, famously uh, said that you can't, you can't really instruct uh, morality. And, and he said this, that, you know, he, he was, I guess, sort of forced to teach uh, a class in, uh, in business ethics. Right. And he said, I'll teach this, but what I'm going to teach is that I don't think that you can teach this, at least yeah. not effectively. And in our paper, he really makes a similar point that uh, part of why self-transcendent experiences are interesting is that they have this effect on morality yes where exactly. explicit modes of instruction don't no. seem to so right yes and so exactly so this comes back to my stages of spiritual development uh, argument which is it takes some for some people not all it takes some deep profound experience to move somebody to transform their self, their ego, their sort of stage of development as, uh, uh, you know, a la Kohlberg, for example, or um, uh, just one of these sort of developmental uh, theorists, to, to understand, to have that profound experience, to then sort of be awakened or create insight into, wow, there is more than the perspective that I have. There's something greater than me. You know, and so it bumps you up a stage of development, so to speak. So now you're able to move. So the, the development, the, the stages that Fowler... Uh, but don't you uh, think positive. that's really just a temporary change? It, it and can that, be, but it can be more, I think, think so. permanent, huh. where you actually move from what he calls the synthetic conventional uh, stage, which most people stay in all their life, uh, which is all about, uh, there's a distinction between symbolic self and relation to others, um, but it's very conventional. And this is the, the Kohlberg talks about you stick to convention. But whereas where some people may have some profound spiritual experience, they switch to this sort of individual reflective or faith based stage of development where you move beyond explicit ideological systems and the boundaries of identity constructed in previous stages. Yeah, this is really interesting that you're you're. Uh turning to this work we have to we have to talk about this another yeah, time yeah. i think I, I i'm just <laughs> starting to sort of think i don't about it. 
I I really have some big problems with it. I, I don't think I buy it. So well, this is good. We'll have to have a have more discussion. I, I know we, we're going to have to have a totally separate conversation just on this because That's this great. is this is fascinating. In so fact, I do, it, hope, but, I do hope to ask the, yeah. the monastics a little bit about these sort of stages and whether they think that there is some sort of stages of moral or ethical development that are necessary in order to move from a state of suffering to flourishing that is beyond just mental training. That's really interesting. So, so you're looking to learn uh, throughout this process. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So what do, you, what do you hope to impart to them? I mean, if you could boil it down to a nutshell statement, I mean, what do you hope they take from your course on neuroscience? I, I, so f- at least for this particular uh, instance when I'll be there, uh, I really hope to just talk to them about how we conceptualize self from a neurobiological point of view um, and uh, at least give them one model that they can understand. And that actually fits with our SART system because we talk about that in that paper as well, the systems of selfing. And, uh, and how, that le- how that relates, I want to have a dialogue about how that relates to their system of selfing, which can be actually attributed to the uh, aggregates of self or the skandhas, what they call aggregates. And they refer to five different aggregates which, which compose the self, which are form or matter, uh, sensation, perception, cognition, dispositional formations or mental habits, and the conscious phenomenological experience. So just taking those, for example, I could imagine, uh, I could imagine you doing this two different ways because there's, of course, so much information yeah. in the cognitive neurosciences. So I could imagine you taking the approach of finding all of the data that supports this particular framework or characterization, or really of the Buddhist path in general. Uh, or I could imagine you bringing in data that challenges specific aspects of it. You know, the Dalai Lama also famously said that if there was... If, right. if, if science were to find an, el- an el- element of Buddhism uh, or to prove it false, then Buddhism would have to change. So is there any element of that that you'll introduce into the course of sort of challenging uh, yes. parts of the that's, tradition? That's a good question. And uh, if you have suggestions, I'm happy to take them. <laughs> I mean, I... The I listeners I, might. That would be interesting to hear. The, some su- the listeners might there there might be some people who yeah, have some please, suggestions. Uh, feel free to to pass on. That'll any be interesting to see. You have on the self that you, especially related to the aggregates or the skandhas, that you think may be in error. <laughs> that I can challenge the monks uh, on. I do think that some of the breakdown of those categories uh, may not quite fit with our physiological distinctions that at least I was making. Like perception and cognition is sort of lumped together. And, uh, and it's separate from sense sensation. So I would try to get a little bit more nuanced view on how they break or how they categorize, how they distinguish sensation from perception and cognition. Uh, because that has a very specific time scale and um, you know, different substrates for each. Uh, yeah. And so I want to know uh, how that, th- those sort of non-conscious processes may also contribute to maladaptive uh, self-processing. That's interesting. Yeah. So, so basically, you'd want them to take away from this that there exists a vast amount of empirical evidence underneath a, many elements of the Buddhist tradition that might be. So that alone might be worthwhile. Yeah. Uh, uh, Will there be any kind of discussion of scientific thinking or critical thinking as a skill that sort of undergirds the scientific worldview in general? I mean, will you try to teach those skills as well? Uh, sort of, you know, the, you know, doing hypothesis testing and things like this, where we can go. Sure. Um, I, I think so. I think that's so part of the, the idea is, you know, let's let's also talk basics of science. Like, okay, so now if you have a question about what I'm what I'm talking about, and you don't believe, you don't buy into some of my ideas, well, that's great. 
because yeah. that means you you have a hypothesis about how something could be different. Let's test it, you know. And that's what's great about science is that we can take a theory or a model, and we it's always I always like to think of it as a work in progress because you you're always testing it and refining, and that's the idea. So the so they are are going to be great students because they'll be able to sort of challenge me and the sort of the Western perspective about how we conceptualize self or mind. And we can then pose a question or a hypothesis. And if the resources are there, we can then cr do a study. Um, That's great. That, and I think that would be, so for long term, I'm hoping that we can continue to do these kinds of dialogues there in India and bring them here. Too, to the West and have them in labs like our like our own well would you would you want to do a conversation while you're over there I mean and maybe through have, Skype? Through, yeah do one of these do a meaning of life TV we conversation that sounds Absolutely. great yeah, I'm up for it <laughs> that uh, would be fantastic the internet's good there <laughs> <laughs> well that's probably not the case but uh, you know uh, we could try that would yeah, be fun yeah let's keep that in mind I I was actually asked to I don't know if you've ever seen uh, these things, but uh, these are, uh, this is a, a Muse headset. No, I haven't. Uh, so it's um, by a company called Interaxon, and uh, we, we, we're doing a little work with them. Essentially, this is a EEG headset. It records four channels, and uh, you can... Uh, it has an app with it to help facilitate concentration on the breath. Really? And does it have an impedance meter and you can look at yeah, it, 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 it built in it, and everything? It's built into the app. Wow. Yeah. And it works Bluetooth and all the data is sent uh, to, the, to the Google uh, uh, um, servers. That's fascinating. So I was uh, asked to give some of these to the monastics to see if they could try it out. Uh, so we'll see if that um, if that works. It's a very easy way. It's not the best technology, but it's certainly a, a start uh, to help you know bring technology also or innovation into the hands of the monastics. That's really it. so. So, could you imagine monastics ever adopting if a brain stimulation module looked like that and was that degree of portable and, and inexpensive? Do you think? that say Tibetan Buddhist yeah. monks would use them if they were if they were shown to be efficacious and enhance I think meditation. So. I mean, especially if his holiness was uh, so you know, into it. <laughs> I, I, as long as I think there's um, some vetting going on by a few people. Um, I'm sure you know Richie Davidson will be there and uh, he's usually the sort of senior level scientist to to vet these technologies or, or, or theories. Yeah, he, uh, he, I talked to him about this and, and he told me that it was pure hubris to imagine that we know enough about what's going on in meditation uh, to imagine that brain stimulation could have any kind of positive effect. But, I mean, we're testing it here at Penn, so we'll have an answer for him. Well, it, see, there you go. Soon. I think it's still a matter of scientific, empirical, you know, uh, testing and and that it's an empir these are empirical questions. Sure, uh, we can test them, and that's what's great about science is that we're going to continue trying to test these things. and And so I don't really poo poo anybody who's trying to find the neural correlates of enlightenment, for example, because I just think that it's a science, it's a process, uh, and you know we're we're learning about what these experiences are. So spiritual experiences may we started with that, and you know, a lot of people, including Richie, have stay, strayed or stayed away from trying to operationalize what it is because it's very personal and there's so many, there's such a heterogeneous sort of way of describing that experience among, across traditions. Has he had a, an experience? That's a good question. Yeah, you know, because we put together that book, Being Called, where we had scientists and scholars describe their experiences yeah. and it, it just occurred to me that I that I don't know I don't know if I've ever read about him describing his experience and I've never heard him say that he has um, but it's I will ask him that's a good question yeah, please do so we'd love to have you on again f from Dharamsala India uh, teaching Tibetan monks your neuroscience course 
Uh, yeah. Thanks, thanks so much for for talking with me today. Sure, David, it's a pleasure talking with you. I love to to uh, talk again. So thanks again for inviting me. Yeah, sure, great. Talk right, to you soon. Care.